From athletes to authors, entertainers to innovators, we connect with those who help shape our culture. Join us in revealing stories of their lives and backgrounds, their triumphs and tragedies that molded them into who they are today. Authentically off script and personally illuminating, this is Audibles with Jason Scarborough. This week on Audibles, Jesse Mitchell. All right, so Moss Point, Mississippi, that's where we begin your story. So how would you describe growing up in, in Moss Point? Man, um, football town, USA. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, uh, growing up in Moss Point, football was, it was drilled into you at a young age. <laughs> uh, I mean, people always wonder why we had such phenomenal programs. It's because it started really at a young age. Our Pee Wee programs were phenomenal and they fed into our middle school programs and then ultimately our high school programs. So, in that city, football rule, period. How would you describe your family growing up there in Moss Point? Oh man, I came from a house of three boys. Um, I'm the youngest. Um, a lot of people know my brother Kareem, he's three years older than me, he played at LSU. And then we had our older brother who was killed in 95. Um, there was a 10 year difference between us, but you had to be tough growing up in our house. Um, our daddy was a tough man. Um, and I, you know, he was an athlete and he coached us in everything from baseball, to football, to basketball. Um, you had to get it, man. It, it was, it was no, <laughs> no room for the week. <laughs> so two D1 athletes in the house, right? Mm -hmm. And you're the youngest. So I'm sure you got away with everything, right? Being the baby, is that right? Man, no, <laughs> what, 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 what happens, here's how I think it operates, Jason. I think as the younger uh, kid, you do the same things, you mm -hmm. just see how to do it better and not get caught. Right. So right. That's, that's, what, uh, my, that's what my brother always tells my dad. He's like, man, and they call me JM. He said, JM used to do the same things we did. It's just he <laughs> knew how to do them by watching us, what to do and what not to do to get caught. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it was, no, they, were, they weren't taking any slack off of me because, I mean, not just my parents, but as the younger brother, you catch it from the older brothers. Mm -hmm. They're willing mm -hmm. to beat on you whenever. So, <laughs> With two D1 athletes in the house, wh where does that athletic ability come from? Where do you trace it back to? Man, uh, my dad would say it's him, right? Uh, right. But he, I think we got it, honestly, from both sides of the family. Um, we have some very athletic um, cousins on uh, my mom's side as well. Um, and it was, it was one of those things where competition was a healthy word in our house. Um, it is, you compete. I mean, you compete from the time you wake up. Uh, growing up to, you know, we had a, a single, one single bathroom in the whole house. You had to compete for your time in the bathroom. You had to compete for, you know, how much food you get on a, at, at dinner. Um, and then for us, we were always outside. And it was from basketball to football to baseball to whatever. Everything, every day was a competition. So, um, and for me being a little brother, I think that gave me a unique advantage because when it came time for me to play with kids my age, I was, I mean, it was, it was gravy compared to, you know, having a, a brother who's 6'5", 270, you know, beating on you. How old were you when you, when you knew or when you first recognized that you had a special talent for, for football? Um, man, it, it's, it, Jason, it's hard to say because, like I said, our Pee Wee leagues were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Kevin Fant and I played Pee Wee football coming up. He was the only guy in the league who could really block me. We, we talk about that all the time. <laughs> uh, but it was hard to say because we had so many athletes that even great athletes looked average. Um, but I think maybe, to be honest, probably, I knew I was good in Pee Wee football in, in junior high, but maybe my junior year of high school is when I really realized, all right, this is, this is something special. But I, I had some big shoes to fill with my brother. It was all, he was my toughest critic. Um, and so, you know, I knew I had to go and get it. 
And so I, I, I did, but I think probably my junior year is when I realized, all right, you, you got a shot. So was football always number one for you, or were there other sports that you're already smiling that, that came before football? Yeah, uh, man, my dad will tell you, if you interviewed him, <laughs> do you have any regrets with Jesse? And he would say, yeah, he, that he allowed me to quit baseball. Really? And I was, baseball was my thing. I mean, I can lose a baseball. What position? I played catcher, and then I always hit third or, or fourth. I mean, from if people will tell you, like, when I was young, Pee Wee, uh, I mean, Pony League, base, you, you did not want to throw me a baseball. Really? Um, and, but football ruled. And what happened is my sophomore year, I tore my first ACL. And um, I had surgery right after football season. So that's nine months of rehab. So I did not go back to baseball and I just focused primarily on football. But, and I, I do regret it too. Uh, but my dad, he would tell you, he said, that's my one regret is I let you stop playing baseball. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. extra mile and we're taking you with us we have a responsibility to get the work to the streets join us on the extra mile podcast as we travel mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders gotta have the ability to get their product to market infrastructure stakeholders and mississippi locals to give you a behind the scenes look at transportation throughout the state highways um, movement of goods these are things that we rely on every day you can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting gomdot.com forward slash the extra mile I'm Horn. And I'm CPA. This is Jane. Hi. Nice to meet you. Jane is looking for a CPA to help with compliance. Nice. The CPA is great with compliance. Good to hear. All right, Jane, shoot. I'm looking for some mergers and acquisition advice. Well, I can review forms and dot I's and cross T's, but other than that, I... Yes. We do more than advise on mergers and acquisition. We bring in buyers, help you find capital, put the whole deal together. Really? We also offer wealth strategy collaboration, if that'd be helpful. It would. And if you're in the market to buy, we offer organization development, training, and coaching services. Great to know. When you're done with CPA, let me know. We can chat. She seems nice. Yeah, she's great. Uh, now about those I's and T's. Um, uh, I'm sorry, one second. Do you also dot I's and cross T's? Yes. I I'm gonna. Yep, I would too. Was it always a position, okay, going back to football, was it always, I want to tackle people? Or was there a position in football that attracted you or one that you wanted to play before you eventually ended up along the defensive line? Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> growing up, uh, again, going back to Pee Wee football, the quarterback was the guy. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be a quarterback. And... Um, my dad was an offense and defensive lineman. He loved line play. Um, but like my third year, and he was my coach, my third year playing PB football, I said, all right, I'll give you a shot at quarterback. Mm -hmm. And so I played quarterback for that year, and I realized, Jason, I don't like to be hit. <laughs> <laughs> I do not like to be the target of being hit. And so... You want to be given the pain instead of yes, receiving the yes. pain. Yes, and some right. people are like, hold on, but you play defensive. It is different when you have 11 guys hunting you, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I played quarterback that one year, and then I realized my money is going to be made on the other side of the ball <laughs> because I love to tackle, but I don't want to be tackled. So, um, yeah, I wanted to play quarterback, and he gave me my shot, and I gave him, after that year, I gave him the ball back and said, look, I'm going back on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then through junior high, um, uh, and then I, I played defensive line, and in junior high I played linebacker. My body, I was always kind of a tweener, um, where I was – 
big enough to play defensive line, but also small enough and agile enough to play linebacker. So in um, junior high, I played linebacker uh, mostly. And then when I went to high school, I played, we kind of had, well, I think they called it a jack backer back then. Our nose guard would be down on some defenses and then we would be up on other defenses. So yeah, we ran a 6-2 and then which would convert when you stand up to a 5-3. Um, and so that worked for me and my coaches were able to, to use it. Um, but then ultimately, I just kind of mastered the technique and understanding of playing defensive line, and that became my thing. Moss Point High School was, it was such a powerhouse back in the day. You, you referenced that when we started. It's produced a lot of great athletes, including yourself, obviously. You guys won a couple of state titles uh, during your time there, twice against Sal Panola, if I remember right. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Not a lot of people can say that. They still refer to Sal Panola as the University of Sal Panola. You play for one of my favorite guys ever, Coach Jerry Alexander. What are some of the memories that go through your mind? You know, the state titles, obviously, beating Sal Panola. But I, what, what comes to the forefront when you think about your days playing at Moss Point? Man, how the, the number one thing is how our entire city mm -hmm. always was behind us. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to go and rob every house in Moss Point, just wait till Friday night because everybody in that city is going to be at the game. Um, and that support was felt throughout our team um, and throughout the program. Mm -hmm. So that was the number one thing for us. If we, I mean, we would have, when we would travel, we would have more on the visiting side than the home team would have. Um, and I think that was a huge intimidation factor as well. We won a lot of games, Jason, before we stepped off the bus. We did. I mean, it was a lot of times kids were terrified to play us. Um, but when we got into, and, and Coach Alexander always made sure we played elite competition. Mm -hmm. Every year he would schedule the reigning champs um, out of, it was 5A was the highest classification then, 5A from Louisiana, Florida, and Mississippi. That's how we played. We actually, I actually beat South Panola three years in a row. Wow. Um, we went to South Panola my senior year, and we played them the first game of the season, and we beat them there. Three years in a row, we beat them by three points each time. That's incredible. Not many people can say that to, to this day. And I can vouch for the Moss Point walking off the bus and y'all already up a touchdown. <laughs> Former Brandon Bulldog here. I can remember those yeah. days playing against Moss Point. Wasn't fun at all. I'm curious, you know, you played with a lot of great athletes. You played against a lot of great athletes. You know, this state produces a lot of great football players. Who's the best high school football player that you played against or, or saw while you were at Moss Point? Man, all right. Um, and I'm going to break that down probably in three ways. So, the best high school athlete that I've ever seen, uh, well, played with or against is Francisco Kelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who was a teammate of mine. Um, you're talking about a guy who is about six, three and a half, probably about 210 back then, but still was the fastest guy on the field um, at running back. And when we needed him to, which is very rare because we were so talented, they would pull him over, play defense. And I mean, he would cover the best guy. He would cover, you know, dandy dozen wide receivers, and he really had no snaps on the defensive side of the ball. He is the best athlete that um, I've ever seen in, in high school, played with or against in high school football. Now, the best one I've ever seen um, is probably going to be Dwayne Root. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Now, he's older than me before my time, but um, I watched him in the Mississippi-Alabama All-Star Game, and that was a grown man amongst boys. <laughs> I mean, period. <laughs> period. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. 
We hope you're enjoying Audibles with Jason Scarborough. Watch every full, unedited episode via our digital platforms. Download our free Roku TV channel simply by searching for Audibles on your Roku device. Look us up on our YouTube channel, too, under Spirit Media Network and hit subscribe. And enjoy episodes of Audibles along with our other original content. Bookmark our website at spiritmedianet.com and stay up to date on what's happening on the Spirit Media Network, where we're changing the game. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought after interior details, including corbels, post, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile. Being in Meridian for a long time, the Cole family's put out a lot of a great athletes, and he was phenomenal. You are right. So I'm curious, coming out of Moss Point, what expectations did you have personally, if any? What, what were your goals and expectations in terms of playing at the next level coming out of Moss Point? It's understood that that is the goal. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it is. Back then, there was a – it's kind of like most like most families look son you expected to graduate high school and you expected to go to college mm-hmm. as an athlete in Moss at Moss Point and especially in our house it was expected that you were you had to write your own ticket to get a scholarship because even though both of my parents worked and worked hard there's no way they could afford to put us through school um, so my dad invested his time in making sure we were great athletes and good students um, in order to create and make our own way. So the expectation was you, go, you gotta make your own way and get a scholarship. And then when Kareem set the bar, so I mean, Kareem was a <laughs> phenomenal and dominant um, athlete. I mean, he was a five-star recruit. Um, everybody wanted him. So me being three years younger, looking up, it was like, all right, this is the standard. You got to, and I wanted to play with the best. And so the SEC was my standard. And so how can I get in and break into that? And that's what we did. So you play for one of the classiest, nicest guys and not just college football, but, but all the sports, Coach David Cutcliffe. What was your first meeting like with, with Coach Cut? Man, uh, the first meeting with Cut, so you got to understand, we were in a unique situation because we started being recruited by Tuberville, Mm -hmm. and then he leaves in December. And so Cut comes in, and he's trying to scramble and put together coaching staff and pick up recruits. Um, And then Tuberville is at Auburn now trying to recruit me to Auburn, but um, I had my official visit to uh, Ole Miss with Coach Cut, And right away, you just see his character. Right away, you see his character. And I think that put my parents at ease um, with him. And then the coaching staff he put together was phenomenal. Young group of ex-athletes who had just kind of, I mean, they were four or five, six or seven years out of college, knew the game, 
knew how to coach, and he gave them their first shot, most of them now. I mean, a lot of those guys. He was a, ultimately, he was a product of his own success because the NFL started picking those guys off. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I ended up committing to um, Coach Cut um, on my official visit, first time I met him. He just, he was honest. He was straightforward. He didn't make any promises except, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to compete. And where you, you know, the rest is up to you, and he did. You redshirted your freshman year in 99, and looking back on that now, you know, I've heard you in other spots say, you know, hey, blessing in disguise, something to that effect. Do you still feel that way when you look back on it? Absolutely. Um, And that came from, so Cut actually gave me the opportunity to make the decision. Mm. Um, I had a real good freshman camp in a, in, in a great uh, first year, and he said, look, I got to try to make a decision, and, I, you know, I, I want to give you input. And so I talked to my dad, but then my brother Kareem called me. He said, red shirt. He said, trust me, he said, it'll be the best thing for you. He said, I know you want to play, mm-hmm. but he said, red shirt. He said, your body's going to get bigger and develop. The game's going to slow down for you as you practice against some of these guys. Um, and as well as your first year of school won't be as tough because you're not traveling so much with the team. And it was the best. I mean, he's given me a lot of advice. Much of it I don't listen to, but that was the <laughs> <laughs> that was the best advice he's ever given me. It really did change. I think it was uh, probably the number one catalyst to why my career was what it was. So finally, in two thousand, you finally get on the field. Do you remember putting you on the spot here? Do you remember your first play in in, in uniform? Do you remember? Yes, I I, I do. Um, I remember my first play, um, we, we, so Coach Petrie, he sends me in. Coach Petrie had a great, man, we had a great room of athletes in the defensive line room. Kendrick Clancy, um, Kamon Fisher, Tyler Williams, and those guys did a great job of bonding with us and, and bringing us young guys up. And uh, when the time was called, you know, we were playing um, against Memphis. And it's like, all right, y'all go, you know, Jesse, you, you up, go in. You know, and it's like, all right, now I get to all this work for the last year and a half, mm-hmm. now I get to put it in play. But your mind just starts to race because you're now back in real live action. And so my first series, I was on the ground, making false reads, you know, sitting back waiting. And I remember, um, you know, talking to some of the other guys, like, listen, slow down and do what you do. This is why you're here. Do what you do in practice. And then you slow down and you start to do what you talk. Go back to what you are and then rely on your athleticism and your strength. And you start making plays. So absolutely, man, I'll never forget that moment. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. Remember the neighborhood grocery store of your childhood? The place where everyone knew your name or where they still help you carry your groceries to the car? Well, welcome back to the good old days. Allen's Supermarket delivers that and more. Since 1967, Allen's Market has strived to serve the best meals in the metro. So stop on in. Fill that tank up. Whether it's your fridge or your car, we've got you covered. Allen's Supermarket, proud sponsors of Ole Miss Baseball's National Championship run. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. 
You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile. We hope you're enjoying Audibles with Jason Scarborough. Watch every full, unedited episode via our digital platforms. Download our free Roku TV channel simply by searching for Audibles on your Roku device. Look us up on our YouTube channel, too, under Spirit Media Network and hit subscribe. And enjoy episodes of Audibles along with our other original content. Bookmark our website at spiritmedianet.com and stay up to date on what's happening on the Spirit Media Network, where we're changing the game. You're watching Audibles with Jason Scarborough. So in 2000, you guys finished 7-5, Music City Bowl, West Virginia. West Virginia's up by just not your day. Yeah. And so you get introduced to, or at least on a national scale, we get introduced to who you call to this day Easy Money. Easy Money. Eli comes in the game, Eli Manning. Nearly leads a comeback, but you guys knew of his greatness, I'm sure, before that. Oh, man, absolutely. Um, I mean, his legend had preceded him. Um, and then we saw his work in practice. We saw his talent in practice. And, you know, we're all sitting over there as, as freshmen in the bowl game, and it is cold. I mean, that's the coldest game, probably the coldest I've ever been, period, in my life. But we were at Adelphia and they had the heated benches. So, you know, as fresh, we knew, we, you know, we really wasn't playing or playing to play. And so we were on the heated benches getting warm. And then, you know, the game was getting out of hand and Cutcliffe made the decision, hey, play the freshman. So the phone call comes uh, from up top, hey, play the freshman. Offensive and defensive, like, man, we got to go in. But offense went in first. And dude just started dropping dimes, walking him down the field. And the stadium is going crazy. And we're like, yeah, we, we know this is what he does. We see it every day in practice. Um, and the legend was not born, but I guess known to everybody at that point. 2001 rolls around, and you guys are under Cutcliffe, trending in the right direction, right? Uh, finished 7-4. and four. Um, and then in 02, you guys finished 7 to 6, Independence Bowl. I've heard you talk about the lead up to the Nebraska game. I've heard you talk about this elsewhere, how there seemed to be this disrespect, this arrogance with this Nebraska football team. And there was a guy in particular that you were lining up against, Richie Incognito, who yep. was running a lot of smack, just oh. to put it bluntly. Yeah. And so you were you were ready for this matchup, no doubt. Well, I mean, all you know, you, the bowl game, you go down to the location, both teams, and y'all have these dual events where both teams are there. And um, in previous bowl games, you know, it, it wasn't tense or they're one team looking down their nose at the other, but this one, man, Nebraska was so arrogant. Um, they felt like they shouldn't be in the Independence Bowl. They were better than us. They shouldn't be here. And all week, that's what we heard. And um, Rich Incognito, who actually was played with the Dolphins, bullied the guy. Well, he got bullied that whole <laughs> that whole day in game. But we started off the game, and uh, Coach Drizback, uh, you know, sometimes coaches just get in a little nervous. And he had us doing a lot of stunting and moving. And um, about the second, and they were moving the ball. And about the second series, I went to the sideline and I, uh, Walker Jones was our GA then, defensive GA. I said, Walker, man, tell Coach Petrie, who's my coach, who's up in the box with Drizback, tell him call base defense, let us play. And Drizback and, and Coach Petrie are going back and forth. And then he said, all right, y'all got it. Next series going out playing base defense, and you can see that whole game shift. I mean, we went two tackles for losses, sack, three and out. Come back, sack, two tackles for losses. I mean, it was the probably, I think it was the best game I've ever played. And Richie Incognito, they ended up pulling Richie Incognito after the third quarter. The play I remember was when, you know what I'm talking about. Goal line. You, you pushed him back. Yeah all the way into the backfield, yeah. you didn't even touch the ball carrier because you pushed yeah. Richie into the ball into carrier for Nebraska. Yeah. I mean, he just knocked everybody down. It was just like a massive humanity in the backfield. 
I've watched that clip, and I know you've watched oh, it a bunch. Oh, man, yeah, that, that that's the <laughs> clip of all clips. Um, we knew it was, you know, it was third and goal, and we had been playing phenomenally as a defense, and it was a big stop for us. And um, I'd been moving and playing a lot of finesse game because they ran the read option. Uh, but on the goal line, we knew their play. They were going to try to get a ball to the fullback. There was nowhere for me to go except over him. And, um, I mean, just good pad leverage, good technique. And you're right. I didn't even have to shed him. I just took him straight into the fullback. Fullback falls and we, you know, they have to kick a field goal, not settle for. Do you play that sometimes for people here? In the, I'm just curious. You play that for people here in the office? No. Sometimes they say, "Look, just remember, I, I'm still this guy, right?" Yeah. I, I would if I were you. No, my my son, uh, he found the clip, and uh, he'll he'll, you know, he's making fun of me every now. He's like, "Dude, you were big and you were you were fat back then, Dad." <laughs> But I told him, I said, well, I, I, I can do the same thing to you, but probably not now. I mean, he is, he's an athlete in his own right. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind the scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought after interior details, including corbels, posts, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. Our favorite venues, watching our favorite teams while tailgating with the best fans in the South. We're all back to full capacity this fall. That's why now is the time to book your stay for your favorite college football weekend at Mississippi's premier full-service bed and breakfast. Kay Tyler and the staff at Cart Barn Inn will meet every expectation of you, your family, and your friends. Call and book your reservation today at 662-983-7829 or log on to cartbarninn.com. Cart Barn Inn, cozy luxury in a brown paper bag. So 2003 rolls around, you've got all the pieces in place, Eli, you've got Charlie Anderson on defense, Eli and uh, Chris Collins, and you've got uh, Turner and Sanford and just all these, na- Espy, all these names on offense, and you and Charlie Anderson and so many other names on defense, anchoring the defense, and then you get to the big game with LSU, who I believe at the time was like number three, number two, somewhere in yeah. there in the country. And so for you, this was kind of personal. Absolutely. Right, because of your brother. So I, I got to ask what the atmosphere, I'm at that game in the stadium. Yeah. I know what it was like as a fan. What was it like for a player to play in that game? Man, whenever you play LSU, for us, that is, and I love going to play in Baton Rouge. Obviously, this one was at home. But that's the test of tests. You know, you, you have LSU, Alabama, but especially back then with LSU, you knew it was a power run game. And for us, that is a test of a defensive lineman's manhood. Mm-hmm. So for us, it, we knew that that game was going to ride on our shoulders, um, stopping the run, which you stop the run, you put the ball back in Eli's hands and let him do what he does. Um, so the atmosphere and, and everybody knew it was the SEC West on the line. So it doesn't get any bigger than that. 
So the, the game goes back and forth. LSU prevails. Uh, you guys bounce back. Uh, blow out Mississippi State in Jackie Sherrill's last game. I'm sure you take some solace in that for sure. And then you have a bowl win over Oklahoma State. For your final moments as a Rebel, I always want to ask former athletes this because everyone has a different answer, but sometimes it's the same. What was that moment like when you took the helmet off, took the pads off as a Rebel for, for the final time? What was that moment like? <clears throat> Man, it is, it's a feeling that's hard to explain because yes, you, you've just won a bowl game, but you also know that's your last college snap mm -hmm. right and that a lot of your teammates who you play with they'll never take another snap anywhere else um i knew that i had a, a possibility of going to the nfl but man you, you know you're with these guys for four and in my case five years because i red shirted they're your brothers they're your family and you know that tomorrow that life is about to change it's the epitome of Bittersweet. It is bit, It is the epitome of bittersweet. You get to spend some time with the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. uh, injuries creep up like they do. So at that point, you're faced with, with what's next. Correct. So I got to know, where did pursuing a, a, a career in the legal profession, mm -hmm. when did that show up on the radar? Um, it was a seed that was planted um, a long time ago. So you interviewed one of the people you interviewed is Dick Scruggs. Mm -hmm. So um, I graduated from high school a semester early. And again, I'm giving my brother Kareem too much credit. <laughs> but um, I had a choice to go ahead and roll in the Ole Miss or um, stay home and, and, you know, do something different. So what I did was I took nine hours at the community college that would transfer to Ole Miss. I lifted weights and then I worked for two attorneys. One was Calvin Taylor, who who ultimately introduced me to Dick Scruggs, and getting in there and just seeing those guys, the way they litigated, the way they work, and I was like, I can do this. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. I'm Horn, and I'm CPA. This is Jane. Hi. Nice to meet you. Jane is looking for a CPA to help with compliance. Nice. The CPA is great with compliance. Good to hear. All right, Jane, shoot. I'm looking for some mergers and acquisition advice. Well, I can review forms and dot I's and cross T's, but other than that, I... Yes. We do more than advise on mergers and acquisitions. We bring in buyers, help you find capital, put the whole deal together. Really? We also offer wealth strategy collaboration, if that'd be helpful. It would. And if you're in the market to buy, we offer organization development, training, and coaching services. Great to know. When you're done with CPA, let me know. We can chat. She seems nice. Yeah, she's great. Uh, now about those I's and T's. Um, uh, I'm sorry, one second. Do you also dot I's and cross T's? Yes. I I'm gonna. Yep, I would too. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile. Start your legal career with one of the largest, most successful defense firms in the South, Baker, Donaldson, Beerman, Caldwell, and Berkowitz. How would you describe that that time prepared you for, I mean, having, having your own yeah. office now, how did that time prepare you? Um, it was huge because 
what it allowed me to do was to learn what the defense does. I mean, you, you, you see it kind of in football. You see a lot of the offensive coordinators mm -hmm. were defensive guys, right? So if you know what the other side wants to do, you know, you could beat them to the punch. But um, I worked for some great guys, their partners, uh, Bill Jones, who also played at Ole Miss, um, Bill Reed, Barry Ford. They threw me in the fire early and got my hands wet in, in hearings and in trials, every aspect of litigation from the defense side. Now I'm on the plaintiff side battling those guys every day. So that was, um, I mean, I, the experience I got from that whole, my time with Becker Donaldson was, was, I mean, it's invaluable. So you're the founding partner of the Mitchell firm. This is where we're sitting, beautiful office, Thank by you. the way. Uh, you're described, I'm gonna read this to you, people love when I do this. One of the most well-rounded, unique, and diverse litigators in the Southeast. He's already smiling. You were honored by super lawyers as a rising star, an honor that's bestowed on less than two and a half percent of the attorneys in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee combined. That's a lot of success that, that you're now enjoying in the legal profession. So I gotta know what parallels are there, if any, between the gridiron and the courtroom? Man, it's many. Really? Many. I, I think that gives me uh, definitely, my football career gives me a unique advantage in this. The way you prep, prepare is the same. Hmm. Um, the, I mean, obviously playing football wasn't the biggest guy, uh, wasn't the fastest guy. But the thing I could do is watch film and prepare and know what my opponent wanted to do before they want to do it. It's the same here. Um, the way we litigate is most of the times we're, we're going up against huge corporations. And so we do our homework beforehand. We have the bulk of our case already prepared and know our strategy and our angles uh, months in advance. So when we strike, we're striking with intentional purpose to get exactly what we want in an efficient way, right, to maximize the recovery for our clients. So that preparation um, and then the relentless hours, right? Understand that you're going to lose some small battles, but you gotta win that war. And not let the success go to your head or the failure go to your heart. So for us, man, that transition of learning your opponent, preparing even before the game is played, before Saturday or Sunday, it's the same thing we do here. Now, I know part of the preparation is a nice cigar. Can I say that? <laughs> Always, on camera? absolutely. Because we swapped texts before, yeah. <laughs> and you're having a cigar, yeah. prepping for that's, a big case. Yeah. So that's part of the preparation, Man, right? Everybody, you know, look, that's when, that's when my best ideas and thoughts come to me, really. Is really? When I can just isolate with a cigar um, on my back porch or sitting, you know, outside the office. It really allows me, I shut my phone off, it really allows me to think and think in depth. And that's when some of the best strategies and, and moves that we make here come. So thank you to the Cuban cigars that I get to share <laughs> and smoke. We still got to have a cigar one day, man. We, we, we got to do that. We definitely do. So I, I've heard you say before that you like to recruit former athletes to your firm because there are certain traits that former athletes, most of them, have that you feel are important to, to work in this profession. What, what are those traits? The ability to understand that, one, the preparation. And I know people get tired of me saying it, but the preparation and understanding your opponent better than they understand themselves, but also knowing that hours really there's this is not an eight to five job mm -hmm. right there's sometimes we're here to two three a.m uh, i think every one of my attorneys have slept on a couch here before <laughs> right to try to meet some deadlines um so to understand that look this is a team mm -hmm. and we all have to do this together and sometimes i'm going to ask more of you than you really understand that you think that you can give, but I know it's there, right? And so as a leader and as a, and as a coach, to draw that extra you know, level 
out of each one of you know our paralegals, our attorneys. So yeah, I mean, two of my attorneys they ran track um, either in high school or on a college level. My both my law clerks played uh, football and basketball on a college. So uh, athletes, you can push them, um, and they want to compete. And in this business, comp you know, competing is what we do every day. What would you say your biggest challenge is as a litigator nowadays in, in the current in the current legal climate? With you had all the pandemic stuff, I know that affected y'all. What right now is your biggest challenge as a litigator? I mean, really keeping up the morale of my team. Um, COVID really changed the landscape of trial work because for about two years or a year and 18 months, we were not allowed in courtrooms. Um, so there were no trying of cases, which in this profession, you got to have that trial on our side, on the plaintiff side, you have to have that trial date before the money moves. Um, insurance companies, big corporations, the thing that makes them come to you and cut that check to settle is they don't want to see you in trial. And so nobody's trying cases because the courthouses are closed, they can't impanel juries, then that, you know, keeping your team's morale up to say, hey, look, just keep working, keep preparing, refine your cases even more. So when they do allow, you know, take the chains off and allow us to get back at it, we are ready to go. And we're the first firm saying, look, we're ready to try our case right now today, judge. So that's it, just being a leader and trying to help guide your team through that adversity um, and keep their morale up so we're ready to strike when, it, when it's time to go. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. Got to have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting goemdot.com forward slash the extra mile. watching Audibles with Jason Scarborough. So I'm going to come back to football for a moment. I've heard you other places say that you love being a group text. Mm -hmm. So which, I'm putting you on the spot here, all right, which former rebel cracks you guys up the most? I know you're in there somewhere, right, cracking people up. Which one cracks y'all up the most and which former rebel is least likely to respond to a group text? Because you always got somebody in a group text. Five days later, they're going to respond. All right. So Romero Miller is, <laughs> man, Roe is so intense about college football. I mean, it is, he, if I want to know what's going on in college football recruiting, I just text Roe. Mm -hmm. And Roe knows, and he's going to give you his opinion, and he's going to argue back and forth. So Roe is definitely that guy. Um, most likely not to respond. Oh, man. Uh, probably me. <laughs> You're going to put yourself in yeah, that category. Yeah, pro I would say probably me. I mean, my, <laughs> my phone blows up with group texts, and... There'll be, and, and people know, like, there'll be a hundred messages and then I'll come in with just three smiley faces, ha, 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 ha. You know, I, they, they, you know they, but they, I don't know why they don't even kick me out, why they don't kick me out of these groups. But, um, but yeah, pro I, I will have to be honest with you and say I'm probably the least likely to respond. But uh, Ro is, Ro's going to start it, he's going to be in the middle of it, and he's going to finish it. He's the least likely to respond. That 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that you showed that much humility because most people are like, no, nah, that ain't me. Yeah. No, it's, you say it's you. Yeah. So you've been on a lot of boards, a lot of committees with, with Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. How would you say or, or how would you frame up the job that, that Keith Carter is doing as athletic director there? So I was obviously on the board um, that um, interviewed and selected uh, Keith. And he is, even though we knew he was going to be great at that job, he's exceeded all the expectations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't, like, people don't understand what that job really entails. It is a unique job in America because you are the boss in running and responsible for hiring, firing, and running all these sports programs, which are huge businesses now at these universities. Mm -hmm. And typically your, well, most of your employees, which are the head coaches, right, make more money than you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you still have to find that unique way to be able to communicate, motivate, and be on the same page with them um, while also knowing that they are the typically the face of the university. You know, we, we could talk about all these great universities and you could rarely name any of the athletic directors, but you can name the head coaches. Mm -hmm. And Keith does a great job of putting Ole Miss athletics in a position and making changes in innovative ways to keep us out front and, and impacting college sports. I mean, he was the perfect guy for the job, and he has exceeded everybody's expectations. And he gets a lot of, you know, he catches a lot of flack and blowback, but that's part of the job. Mm -hmm. But you see long term, and you've seen his results and the numbers and the following, it speaks for itself. You guys remind me a lot of each other, and I'm going to tell you why. Because Keith is like one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. But that dude was an assassin on the court, ice in his veins, right? Yeah. You're like one of the most laid back, nicest guys. But if you go Google or look up on YouTube, you see you throwing people around, <laughs> running through people. I mean, how hard is that to, to turn that off and on? Do you ever find yourself in the courtroom fighting that? Well, it, it is. It's extremely hard. Um, but you know what? That is – that's – I think that's one of the most difficult things for athletes to do, but if you can master it, it will pay dividends for you in the long run. Meaning this, when you walk out there on that field, you have to believe that you are the baddest man out there, period. Because if you don't, you've already you, you defeated yourself. But when you walk off that field, you have to understand that, look, I'm human, all right, and that I have to conduct myself in a certain way. I can no longer be that bad man who takes no crap mm -hmm. off anybody <laughs> when I'm in the, you know, when I walk off the field. And so being able to transition between those two is paramount for an athlete, especially after um, the, you, you know, you hang up the cleats, I hang up the shoes. I'm going to tell you this, Jason, and, and Keith has heard me say this plenty of times. You talk about when I, was being recruited by Cutcliffe. When I went on my official visit, we went to an Ole Miss basketball game. I did not know who Keith Carter was. But there was a, um, they were shooting free throws. And somebody shot a free throw, and they missed. And Keith Carter got the ball in, I mean, put his whole elbow in the basketball game. I was like, I don't know who that white guy is, but <laughs> he is my favorite college basketball player now. I tell him that all the time. But I said, Keith, you know you signed me at Ole Miss. Uh, and he, he oh, laughs. Man, I tell him gosh. about that play. But, yeah, he was an assassin on the court. And, and people meet him, and if you've never seen him play, you, you wouldn't know it because he's correct. just as laid back and nice yeah. as he can be. So my final question for you is it, reflective Young Jesse Mitchell, I'm wondering what that young kid growing up in Moss Point, Mississippi, the youngest of three boys growing up in a, a football crazy town, football powerhouse, high school football powerhouse, what would young Jesse Mitchell think of all that you've gone on to accomplish in your football career, your legal career, and just what you do and the impact you have on your community? What, what would that young guy think back in Moss Point about all this? That it was expected. 
Okay. Um, I mean, I was surrounded by phenomenal mentors, adults, teachers. I mean, one of the biggest, uh, there are a number of teachers who made an impact on me from my elementary principal, Ms. Sandra Noble, to my gifted teacher, which her name is Kathy Murray, which is actually Chancellor Kayat's sister. Um, she taught me for years in the gifted program and really, really helped open my eyes up to the intellectual side of me. Um, and then just community organizers, coaches from volunteer coaches like uh, Coach Chestang uh, to my dad who set that expectation and set the standard of, hey, you have greatness within and there's an expectation that you bring it out. Um, so actually probably young Jesse would tell old Jesse dream harder dream bigger and go harder so yeah it was expected this is an interview that I have wanted to do for a very very long time and I'm glad I've gotten to know you like I have just you know through Facebook and just you know different conversations and us knowing some of the same people thank you for doing this and, and I hope we I get to circle it. back and do a part two one day we will. We definitely will. I appreciate you for following up and making it happen. It's good to see you, man. I appreciate Absolutely. you joining us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of Audibles with Jason Scarborough.